Good morning, everyone. We're going to get going again, so if you could take your seats. Thank you. In the second panel, we have uh, one of the hottest topics in uh, political journalism uh, to discuss, and we have a great panel to do it with and a great moderator. It's political advertising, the perils and promise of the modern campaign. I'll let Devon introduce uh, our, our great panel, and I'll give it over to him right now. Devon? Hello, I think this is working and we're avoiding feedback. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, we are gonna talk about political advertising, but I think in a, in a wide range of contexts, few topics generate the widespread interest or strong opinions that are reserved for political ads. Um, this may be because the amount spent on modern elections has exploded, especially in the wake of so-called campaign finance reform. In fact, in today's New York Times, there was a story about how the Romney campaign's goal is to raise $600 million to match the expected $750 million that's going to be raised by the Obama campaign. So we're looking forward to a billion plus uh, election cycle just at the presidential level. And I think Eric could probably point us towards it'll probably be plus two billion across the board. Um, citizens and academics fret about this, and I think there's good reason for them to. Um, they're concerned about the resources required to fund political campaigns, the rise of political attacks at the state and national level, the impact of advertising in general, and negative appeals in particular on voters and their decision making. The assembled experts, and the experts they are, will discuss the scope and impact of political ads in recent elections and the role of journalists in making their perils and promise more visible, and of course, the ethics surrounding all of this. And our panelists are uh, Erica Franklin Fowler, who is assistant professor of government at Wesleyan University and a former graduate of this great university. Uh, she's also director of the Wesleyan Media Project, which takes over from the Wisconsin Ad Project, which ran here for many years. Uh, that tracks and analyzes all political advertisements aired on television in real time during elections. Uh, Fowler specializes in political communication, local media, and campaign advertising in particular, and her work on local news coverage of politics and policy has been published in political science, communication, law and policy, and medical health policy journals. Her work with the media projects has been studied extensively in the nation's leading media outlets. Our second panelist is Charles Franklin. He is currently director of the Marquette Law Poll and visiting professor of law and public policy at Marquette University's Law School. He will soon return to his position as professor of political science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. No matter what hat he is wearing, Charles' specialty is graphical and statistical analysis of public opinion and voting behavior. He is co-founder of Pollster, a widely cited source of nonpartisan analysis of polling trends that was bought by Huffington Post. Um, Charles' new startup is PollsAndVotes.com. Go visit that right now. Get him a few more hits. Um, a site devoted to understanding the structure of public opinion and voting coalitions. And our last panelist is Lee Wilkins, uh, the curator, teaching professor at the University of Missouri School of Journalism. Her research focuses on media ethics, especially media coverage of the environment. She is co-author of Media Ethics, Issues and Cases, now in its seventh edition, and editor of the Journal of Mass Media Ethics. She also co-edited with Cliff Christians, the award-winning Handbook of uh, Mass Media Ethics. The Curator Teaching Professorship is the highest teaching award given at Missouri's four-campus system, so expect to learn a lot. Let's welcome our panelists. <laughs> Thank you for that kind introduction. And Thanks for the opportunity to be here to speak. It's always fun to come back to Madison. The, uh, with those of you who are familiar with the Wisconsin Advertising Project, the, the name has changed. It's now the Wesleyan Media Project, but it is being run by three badgers, so we feel good about that and continuing the tradition. So uh, in any case, I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about, um, we've been doing the tracking uh, since 2010 at, at Wesleyan. And obviously the big impetus for this is, not surprisingly, the Citizens United case that came down um, in early 2010. Um, it wasn't just that case that sort of uh, set the stage for the fundamental shift in uh, the campaign la landscape, campaign finance landscape, um, but it's certainly the one that caused the most media concern, attention among citizens and whatever. And certainly the biggest concern there is obviously the, the concerns over unlimited money flowing into especially political advertising and uh, the types of concerns that we have there. So the goal of the Wesleyan Media Project, just like the Wisconsin Advertising Project before it, 
is to provide greater transparency in elections. So um, there are proprietary firms, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, um, from which anyone with enough dollars can purchase information on the, the scope and extent of political advertising across the country. And so particularly candidates and parties um, purchase this data for their opposition research. research. They want to know where the other side is are placing their ad, ad buys. But there is no publicly available resource for this besides our project and the Wisconsin Advertising Project before it. So our primary goal is to enhance transparency during elections to provide information to the public via the mass media on the extent to which uh, candidates and interest groups are spending in, in um, particular races. What, and not, not just the spending, but also what they're saying, what the issues are that are being discussed, the tone of the ads, and then putting all of that sort of in more historical context. So that's, that's the goal of the project. Um, we get our data from a company called Cantar Media, CMAG, or Campaign Media Analysis Group, and they give us two types of, of information. The first is what we call the frequency data. Um, and I know this analogy is not quite right, but even Ken Goldstein uses it, so I'll continue to, I'll continue to repeat it here, that the technology is similar to uh, what was used to track Russian submarines, that um, the technology, they have tracking devices in each one of the 210 media markets across the United States, and it recognizes the digital seams in programming. So the technology starts listening as soon as an ad starts. And then each ad has what's called a digital fingerprint. You can think of it that way, that the, it listens to the ad, and it knows then via the sound wave pattern, um, which is unique to each ad, whether it's an ad that it's heard before, in which case it just logs an in, in the instance of the ad airing on, say, so up here, and this is too small for you to see. Um, but these are some McMahon ads that were aired in the Hartford media market on, um, let's say, ABC News Nightline. So it tells you down to the second where each ad aired. And then if it's a spot that it has not heard before, the technology actually starts recording the spot. And so the second type of information we get um, are information on the content. And it used to be, and up through 2008 at the Wisconsin uh, Advertising Project, we just got a storyboard of the ad, which is the, the shot on the left here. So it's a few screen captures of what was going on in the, um, on the video, in the visuals, along with the transcript of the ad. Um, but and hope, I'm not sure that this will work. We'll see. Um, as you'll see, if the video will play here, um, what you miss with a storyboard is actually can be quite significant. No, it's not going to play. Um, well, in any case, um, if, if, <laughs> if I had the spot to show you, um, this spot uh, is intended to be actually fairly humorous. That um, the, the to me spot, the very end of it, so it's, you know, um, let me see if I can actually, the demo, uh, 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 job killer, job killer, Pat Toomey, maybe he ought to run for Senate. And so this is the screen um, right up here. And then the, the China flag drops behind him, and there's a sound of a gong, and it says, in China. So there's a lot to be said for um, actually getting the video file with the music, the visuals, and all, all of those things. So starting in 2010, we're able to capture things like mood um, more accurately, uh, music, and um, other sorts of things. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but basically uh, in 2010, this is a screen capture of our online coding tool. We've got uh, students at three institutions, so it's not just Wesleyan that's doing this. It's uh, folks at Bowdoin College and Washington State University. They all log on to an online coding system. They're assigned a random uh, a, a number of ads. They watch each ad and they answer fairly objective questions. Some of them are, uh, are a little more subjective, of course, because they're interesting things that we want to get at. But about the tone of the ad, the issues that are discussed, all those sorts of things. So to put um, 2010 in context, I thought it might be worth just spending a couple minutes on 2010 findings. So um, if you look here at the graph, this is a graph just from September 1st through Election Day, comparing the volume of ads in 2010 compared to the most recent uh, midterm election in 2006, and as you can see just simply by the chart, 2010 was a record-breaking year for political advertising, and record pulverizing might actually be a little more accurate, although then I'm going to be hard-pressed to come up with what the adjective should be for 2012, since we obviously expect that to be even more massive. But there were 2.6 million ads aired, almost a billion dollars spent in federal and gubernatorial elections alone from September 1st through Election Day, and that truly was a historic record. Although, to put that in context, we're expecting at least a billion in the presidential cycle, so um, again, records, records will be fundamentally shattered. 
But the, the other really interesting thing about 2010 is despite all the concerns about Citizens United, despite all the concerns of, of interest group activity, of that $1 billion spent, interest groups only spent $110 million in federal races and $70 million in gubernatorial races. So it really wasn't the case that um, you know, there was all the speculation about interest group activity, and certainly we were seeing an, interest, an increase in interest group activity. But it's also important to keep those things in perspective. So if we look at the distribution of um, interest group ads as a function of all ads aired for both the House and the Senate, one thing you notice by this graph is that in 2010, the interest group activity was not at a historic high in terms of political advertising, that actually the 2000 election had higher rates of interest group um, activity, which was in part the reason for um, the, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act reforms. Um, the other thing we know about 2010, every year people always complain about the tone of the campaign, and everyone is always prone to say that this is the most negative election you've ever seen. Um, and usually I'm of the, of the person to say, well, hold on, you know, you got to look at the evidence and take a look. Um, uh, in 2010, actually early on in the campaign, we, were, we released uh, um, some information saying that it wasn't the most negative campaign, but in the last few weeks, um, we did see it turn um, most negative. And so this is, uh, this is a graphic that aired in the New York Times based on Wisconsin advertising and Wesleyan Media Project data that shows that increase for both parties. Um, you had both uh, Democrats and Republicans at the 50% mark for pure attack ads. Um, we also break out them out by promote and contrast. So uh, again, 2010 was uh, more negative. Um, but the other thing to, that's important to note, important to keep in mind, especially with the concern over interest groups, is that interest groups are not the most negative players in, in terms of those who sponsor attacks. It's actually the party-sponsored ads that are the biggest attack dogs. Um, they're about 96% negative, whereas ind independent groups are, are slightly less than that. They certainly are a big contributor to the increase in negativity, but they aren't the only ones. And another interesting data point is that uh, we also break down ads by the extent to which they focus on personal characteristics, policy um, issues, or to some extent both. And um, sort of the point I always make is that the safe category for any coder who's unsure is to put it in the both category. And with that in mind, what you see here is that interest group attacks are actually more quote unquote substantive. Interest group uh, attacks are more likely to focus on the policy than the other types of components. So from that perspective, perhaps we shouldn't be quite as concerned um, about interest group activity, although uh, obviously there are other types of concerns. So turning to 2010, this is where we really see the, the sharp increase in interest group activity. This is from a press release we put out in late January showing that there's been so far a 1,600% increase in the extent to which interest groups have been involved in the, in the, in the presidential primaries. This is not surprising. Um, but certainly we're seeing that going on. The other interesting thing though, um, and it, I think it's an underappreciated fact about this election cycle, is everyone wants to talk about money. And money is very important. Um, but the other important thing to keep in mind here when you have candidate and uh, super PAC ads in particular is that super PACs are paying a lot more money per spot than our candidates. So money isn't going to tell you everything. You really have to look at the number of spots aired to know what citizens are seeing in particular points here. So you see um, just by this table that um, candidates, and again, these are through late January, had aired just fewer than um, 40,000 ads compared to an interest group ads of just over 30,000 ads and this big price difference between the two. So again, um, knowing the, what voters are seeing on the ground is much different than talking about the aggregate spending numbers. So clearly, uh, for 2012, um, the two big stories that are co are, will continue to come up are, of course, the increase in interest group activity and then the tone. We expect it to be increasingly negative. This primary has been overwhelmingly negative. Um, the numbers for fl the Florida pl primary were in the 90% range for negativity, which is off the charts. Um, so certainly those two things are, are noteworthy and newsworthy, um, but the extent to which we can be concerned about that is something that we can discuss. With that, I'll turn it over to Charles. Let me just make one quick announcement. Uh, if you want to participate over Twitter, the hashtag to use is hashtag UW ethics. Is that it? UW ethics. Uh, uh, so 
please Perfect. join the conversation there and we'll be taking all the questions at the end. Okay. Um, <clears throat> does it have to say click on tools and comments? <laughs> um, Nicer. Uh, I'm sure there are times when you need the tools and comments, but, but um, <laughs> thanks. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about something that's, uh, I want to talk about advertising by not directly talking about advertising, because you've got the leading expert on advertising here. Um, and the way I want to talk about it, happily, turns out to dovetail rather well with the first panel of fact checking and you know how does the public know what it knows how do journalists and others uh, correct facts and quotes and so on and of course uh, as a political scientist I'm going to be pessimistic about the ability to do any of those things um, but let's start with what we would probably mostly agree is my inability to change to the next slide. Oh, down instead of up. Is that the way it works? Down. Well, damn it. Now you've seen. All right. There. Um, sorry. Alleged fact. Gas prices up. Okay. So this is a chart of uh, gas prices, uh, regular gas uh, from 1991 to the present, uh, literally till last week. Um, uh, because Bill is somewhere here, I'm not seeing you, let me say this is nominal prices, not real prices. <laughs> so this is not adjusted for inflation. Uh, but that doesn't really matter for the story I want to tell. Um, so over the last few weeks, you've undoubtedly heard about the rise in gas prices. You've seen it turned into a political weapon. Um, and an argumentation about whether it will become the Achilles heel of the Obama administration in the fall and so on. Um, and that sharp rise, let's see if I can make the laser work, that's happened recently is uh, indeed sharp. As someone who's commuting 160 miles a day can tell you, <laughs> I notice the change in prices every day. Um, fortunately, it's going down right now, so that's, that's a new thing. Um, but anyway, so the point here is that if we lived in a sane world, we would agree that this is basically the price of gas with maybe a side argument about whether real prices needs to be factored in or not. So if I can change the slide, we ask people, can the president do anything about it? Is the price of gas something a president can do a lot about? Or is that beyond any president's control? Can do a lot about 46%, beyond their control, 46%. And so there's a little bit of division about whether this is actually Obama's fault or it's beyond his control. And so there's the debate about this. And what happens when we ask people and break that down by partisanship? Republicans over here, the president can do a lot about gas prices. That's about 62% saying the president can control the price of gas. Democrats, it's almost exactly the same, 62% saying it's beyond the president's control. Okay? In between, independents are a little confused, but they're about even, about slightly more than 50% here, a little, little less than 50 here. Um, and so we have uh, political economists here on the Republican side that say government can control the market. And we have Democrats over here saying there's absolutely nothing the government can do to change market outcomes. So that in and of itself should have gotten a chuckle from you guys. So obviously I'm presenting it wrong. Um, <laughs> And because we have firm economic beliefs and those are related to party, we stick to these beliefs. Here's George Bush in 2006. <laughs> exactly the same question. In the same environment, a spring run-up in prices, it actually turns out to be about the same dollar value of price run-up between 70, 70 cents and a dollar a gallon. Um, and what do we find? Uh, Republicans, it's not quite as large, but still, um, 
A little more than half say it's beyond the president's control. On Democrats, it's all George Bush's fault. So the reason I'm putting this up here is to say if something as seemingly objective as the price of gasoline and something that supposedly people and parties have some firm beliefs in about the market and government's ability to affect the market, is this subject to partisan filtering, the partisans see their guy as responsible or not responsible as they see fit, or more to the point, they see the other guy as responsible if it's bad news, um, then what do you think could possibly happen with television advertising? <laughs> advertising in which you know from the moment the ad comes up that this is somebody trying to sell you something. So it's really surely not at this day and age the case that very many voters are naive that advertising is just the facts, ma'am, and all you have to do is believe me and accept this. So if the partisan filters are this strong for something like gas prices, how much stronger must they be for campaign advertising? And that has a nice little paradox to it, because on the one hand it says, when a Democrat sees a Democratic ad, they're almost certain to go, yeah, you bet. And when a Republican sees a Republican ad, they're going to go, yes. And when each sees the other ads, they say, bull, right? Or something like that. But we're <laughs> being streamed, so it's a family show here today. Okay. And so what happens is, it's not that these ads never have any effect. I'm not trying to go that far. But I am trying to say that to talk about advertising and its impact must require us to think about this problem or this issue in the context of a world in which massive psychological filtering takes place on simple things it must be equally strong on things like advertising. So PolitiFact has this Sisyphean task of trying to convince the party of the presenter of the pants on fire that they should believe PolitiFact and not believe their candidate. And uh, there may be some situations where that can, can play a role. Um, but we have a fundamental problem, I think, of any independent, objective, just interested in the truth source having to contend with what such powerful psychological forces as we see here. Okay, so I am a political scientist, therefore a pessimist, but here's a little bit of kind of interesting stuff about news rather than advertising. And this is whether or not you've heard of the John Doe investigation that those of you not from the state, a quick recap is uh, there's a prosecutor in uh, Milwaukee who's investigating alleged wrongdoing among staff members of uh, Governor Walker's then uh, county executive office. There have been several indictments that have come from that. The governor has not been charged uh, in the investigation, uh, though he has announced that he's uh, hired counsel and started a defense fund. So that's sort of where the state of play is today. And it's fair to say that unless you work in the prosecutor's office or have really good sources, you probably don't really know where this thing's going to end. I certainly don't, haven't got a clue. So we asked people, this is from February, uh, March data is very similar but not exactly the same, so you see how sensitive I've gotten to that PolitiFact panel. Uh, but they're very close, so I'm not misrepresenting this. Um, Heard of the investigation, 72%, this is statewide, 72% have heard of this. That's quite interesting because there's an awful lot of news stories that never come close to 72% awareness. So uh, frankly, I'm a little surprised that it goes to nearly three quarters of the public who are aware of it. And incidentally, there's another 5% that say, I've heard something, but I don't know any of the details. They volunteer that. So it's, it's close to three quarters have heard something. And then we follow that only for those who've heard, because it makes no sense to ask for those who haven't heard, is this really something serious 
or is it just more politics? And in February, it split 52 something serious, 40 just more politics. This poll was done just after there was a new round of indictments. And so I want to just say that because this was pretty quick after there had been new developments in the case. In the March data, awareness is just about the same, but these two are a little closer to dead even. So there seems to have been a little movement over the month towards uh, equalizing the something serious and the um, just more politics. But again, what happens when we look at this by partisanship? And the first really interesting thing is, for all of that filtering we were talking about, the percent of Republicans who've heard and the percent of Democrats who've heard is dead on the same. There's just no difference in awareness by party, which you might think there would be, right? You might think that Democrats would be eating up all the news about this, Republicans would be not paying attention to it. It's not true. The only group that's really less aware are independents. And independents do generally pay less attention to politics. These independents, by the way, are ones who say they're truly independent. They don't lean towards one party or the other. So um, it's a fairly small group, only about 10% of the public in that category. So very equal in awareness of the investigation, but characteristically differences in the interpretation this is about, um, let me just think about this for a second. This is about 65% uh, uh, of Republicans who say it's just politics. This is about 80% of Democrats who say it's something really serious. And that just reflects the same partisan interpretation we were seeing a minute ago. But, so what's interesting about, and, and again among independents, a little bit more just politics, less something serious, and again, a lot of, uh, I don't really know, um, less involvement there. So here's the point, that as powerful as those partisan filters are that we've seen, the figure on the left shows they don't filter taking in the event, taking in the news that there's an investigation going on. They just powerfully filter what you think about that investigation. Um, you know, now, it's not the case that there's never any movement in that. Uh, if we went back to Watergate as the example, we would see the same kind of partisan filtering in um, the fall of 72 and even the spring of 73 with very strong partisan differences in whether this was really something serious or uh, just more politics. But by the time we get to August of 74, there's no longer nearly as strong a partisan filter. That's a case where um, the evolution of the issue reaches a point where even co-partisans become much less willing to uh, uh, deny that it's really something serious. So um, there are points at which partisan agreement is possible. Uh, and not just for scandals. It happens that that's a scandal example. But in general, there can be. I wanted to close with one thing that's just slightly different. We, looking at these kinds of polarization figures, Dems and reps seeing the world so differently, it's easy to conclude in Wisconsin these days that we are a deeply polarized and perfectly divided electorate. And in many ways, that's exactly the right picture. If we're asking anything about Governor Walker as a person or as a governor, if we're asking anything about votes, that's exactly what all the polling shows. We, our poll shows uh, Walker ahead by two over Barrett and by four over Falk. PPP, a Democratic firm, shows Barrett ahead by, I think it's three, and Falk ahead by one. Um, Greenberg Quinlan, which is a Democratic firm, if I remember right, shows um, Barrett up by one and Walker up by one. All of us are well within the margin of error, and we all agree it's a toss-up race. So I think that's really simple and straightforward. So when it's about that, 
about the recall, about the governor. The idea that we're perfectly polarized and very evenly balanced is extremely well supported by all the data. So I wanted to close with one look at a slightly different way in thinking about how the state is divided. And that's this. So these are questions that we've asked over the last three months in the Marquette Law School poll. And the blue ones are the ones where the Democrats have the advantage on the issue. The red ones are the issues where the Republican side had the advantage on the issue. And so just to do the top one, what about cuts to the education budget? By more than a 40% margin, voters say they do not support the cuts to education that were made in the governor's budget. At the opposite end, state employees contributing more to pensions and health, it's about 50% plurality, or majority, it's about 75-25 is the split, saying yes, public workers should pay more for their health benefits and their pensions, okay? Think about this, if this state were in fact exactly divided 50-50 the way it is when it comes to the recall, every one of these issues should be right here at zero, perfectly 50-50 divided. But that's not what you see. There are some areas where Democrats have a strong, indeed, in some cases, an overwhelming advantage. And there are others where it's the Republicans that have the overwhelming advantage. And so for all of the evidence about how voters filter bipartisanship and see what they want to see and reinforce their political beliefs, I think it's worth noting that the polling doesn't just show that we're a perfectly polarized electorate, but it does show that there's actual variation in the strength of support of these different issues. And on some, the Democrats are the clear winners on that issue, and on others, the Republicans are the clear winners on that issue. And sometimes, they're pairs that you wouldn't have guessed. So the last one, we asked a question. Um, um, created by my colleague Amber Wachowski at, uh, at Marquette in the Political Science Department and a UW Poli Sci PhD. Mm -hmm. um, so that credit where credit's due, these are her questions. We carried them. The middle class won't catch a break until the rich pay their fair share of taxes. Big pro-democratic majority, close to 40% more saying, yes, we agree with that. The rich must pay their fair share of taxes. Now, in random order, we either asked that question first, or the first question we asked was, the middle class won't catch a break until state spending is gotten under control. The mirror image of that. <laughs> And so a notion that people are crazy because they simultaneously believe these two things, I reject. These represent different elements of public opinion right now in which the public really does side with a, generally speaking, democratic position that the rich should pay more, while at the same time siding with a Republican position that state spending has to be gotten under control. I think only the most rigid partisan view would say those are in fact illogically combined, that they represent contradictory views. They represent different perspectives on deeply divisive issues of the day, and you see they can go either way. And so ultimately elections and voting and all of that good stuff is the way that we finally I, I'm, not, I'm hesitant to say resolve this issue, but it's at least the way the political system eventually deals with this issue. And in this sense, as divided as we are, as partisan as we are, it's a bit more complicated than what we say when we say we're 50-50, bitterly divided, highly polarized. Thanks. Did you take this up there with you? Yeah. I'm going to let somebody else deal with the technology because otherwise cursing will go out over the <laughs> airwaves. Um, 
I am a journalist by profession, a political scientist by academic training. So I'm going to start by telling you a story. Uh, but I have to say that this is a story about Missouri politics. Missouri politics and Wisconsin politics, the little bit I've been in Wisconsin, are two entirely different levels of politics. So I want to I want to sort of set up the last two minutes of this of this piece that I want to play for you by explaining a little bit about how we do things in Missouri. Um, in Missouri, which can be described accurately as a big red state with a big blue belt, okay, the blue belt being Kansas City, St. Louis, going through the middle of the state, which is Columbia, which is where I live. Um, I think it would be fair to say that we're equally divided. We're the folks who voted for the dead guy, okay, instead of John Ashcroft. Uh, <laughs> and we're also the folks who gave John Ashcroft to the rest of the country. Uh, for the last several uh, legislative cycles, uh, one of the legislators from uh, Columbia, where I live, has introduced a bill in the state legislature that would cap the percentage that payday loan firms are able to charge um, those people who go to them to get loans. Um, PolitiFact, I don't think, has checked this, but depending on where you go and how much you borrow, it can be anywhere in the neighborhood of three to four hundred percent, which is what most people pay. Um, the bill that has been proposed in the Missouri legislature would cap payday loans at 36 percent, which, if we all think about what we're paying for our mortgages, is still pretty much of a ripoff. However, Missouri being Missouri, the uh, legislator who is in charge of the committee where this bill would go in the House, who happens to be a Republican, but in Missouri we have a citizen legislature, so he earns his non-governmental living as, you guessed it, the owner of a set of payday loan firms. So the bill, which has been proposed for, mm, I don't know, the last at least three sessions that I'm aware of, has actually never been allowed to come to the floor for a vote because this particular legislature legislator blocks it. See, now you guys are all really glad you live in Wisconsin, all right, because you, you don't have to deal with this sort of stuff. So, but, but Missouri, just like Wisconsin, has an initiative and, and, and referendum process. So this past year, um, the legislator who keeps proposing it said, well, nuts on that. I'm never going to get this through the legislature. I'm essentially as going to do it by initiative petition. So she starts a petition, and this is where I have to confess, I am both a big D and a little D Democrat, so yeah, I signed it. Um, I thought people should be able uh, to vote on it. But in the post-Citizens United world in which we all live, the initiative petition started by the legislature was, of course, countered by an initiative petition from the payday loan industry, which takes the same issue and phrases it slightly differently. The end result would be that payday loans would be capped at oh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 400%. And because I live in Missouri and not in Wisconsin, you can actually pay people to go around and capture these signatures. But paying people to get signatures costs money, all right? Everybody kind of understand the wacky politics involved here. This is a conference about ethics, so I want to lay down a couple of ethical claims and then I want to play this story for you. My contention is, is that as journalists, we would do a better job serving the public if we stopped reporting who's ahead, for how much, for how long, and if instead we made the story of this election cycle transparency about campaign funding and used that and applied that transparency equally to every single side of the issue. This is tough reporting. It requires time, but I resist the fact that it cannot be done expertly and locally. So with that sort of challenge and setup, I want to play the last two minutes of an eight-minute NPR piece done by a student at the University of Missouri um, on the super PACs behind the initiative petition referendum on payday loans. Now, if you watch the screen, I want to remind you, you're watching the radio. 
So just be <laughs> careful. Two million dollars in revenue last year. Nearly one quarter of that came from its 100 stores in Missouri. What am I, what am I going to do when it stops? Which is okay, all right. In Missouri. Stop it at about Believes 740. The status quo does a great job of protecting consumers. Eric Banks is the spokesperson for a campaign committee called Missourians for Equal Credit Opportunity. The group has raised $1.1 million so far to fight the ballot initiative. His side has almost 10 times as much cash as the other side. So I asked him where that money's coming from. That's not an important issue. The important issue is, should we not continue to have opportunities for people to get credit on an emergency short-term basis? So I rephrase the question. You've raised, you've raised $1,100,000. I said, you're spending all this money to influence voters, and you don't think they have a right to know where the money's coming from? And his answer, again. No, the public has no more right to know exactly where the money is coming from, nor to know where the money is being spent. Actually, under Missouri law, campaigns do have to disclose who's funding them. It's public information. But campaign reports filed by Missourians for Equal Credit Opportunity show every cent comes from one group, a nonprofit that doesn't have to disclose its funding, thereby concealing the ultimate source. While Missourians for Equal Credit Opportunity is fighting to defeat the 36% cap, it's supporting two other initiatives with strikingly similar language, but that would have no effect on the industry. Activists say it's a tactic to confuse voters. Are you all registered voters? I found these two women gathering signatures recently in Colombia. I started chatting with them without telling them I was a reporter right away. What are you uh, getting signatures for? It's to allow voters to be able to decide whether or not they want a cap put on payday loans. It's an initiative to get on the ballot so we can vote on it. What's the uh, payday loan cap? It's right now it's at 41, they will put it at uh, 36. She made it sound like I'd be signing up for capping interest rates on payday loans, but the petition she showed me would instead amend the state constitution banning any such interest rate cap. Finally, I told them I was a reporter and I asked who they were working for. We are um, not really supposed to talk to reporters. So far, 17 states have capped payday loans. Most recently, in 2010, Montana and Arizona voted by wide margins for a third. You can't stop it, okay? Um, I use this as an example of local reporting. Actually, my local NPR affiliate is pretty proud of it, um, in part because they got somebody who was willing to go on the record and say the public has no right to know um, <laughs> when Missouri law says something other. But. I want to point out something that I think is, is, is deeper about what is driving this news story. And, and that is the fact that in the post-Citizens United era, who pays and what they pay for is an important part of any political story. And this is information that journalists historically have not paid very much attention to. I think that there are reasons for that, and they've come up in, in some of the other panel discussions. Um, despite what we say, I think reporting a poll on who's ahead is easier than doing this kind of work. It's what we sort of refer to in-house as a story on a stick. Uh, somebody brings you numbers, uh, you report them. Um, you may not report them very well, but you at least report them, and you feel as if you've given people information. Academics know that when we go and ask people where they're getting especially information about issues in politics, it doesn't come from the news media. Because in the news part of the media, we're busy reporting who's ahead. People get issue information, torqued, biased, however you want to say it, predominantly from political advertising. Yet we act journalistically as if advertising and what funds it is off limits as news. So the second sort of challenge I want to throw down to journalists is to essentially start treating political advertising as if it's a news story. Instead of going around and covering who is ever on the stump, giving the same speech for the, in Missouri, this would be the 800th time, okay? There isn't a lot of variation, at least statewide. Is instead of covering that speech, instead cover the ads. Cover what's claimed in the ads. Cover what's not talked about in the ads. Um, cover the ads as if they were news, and then do what this student journalist did. Ask the people who are paying for the ads to be accountable for them. 
to be accountable for their content, to be accountable for the claims that are made, to be transparent about the sources of their funding. I think that that is a challenge that journalists can meet. It would require a little bit of a sea change in what we call news. But I also think that in this post-Citizens United world, it's a lot more ethical okay, to do this sort of journalism than it is to keep repeating the same mistakes that we know we've been making for the past, oh, I don't know, 20 to 30 years. Um, the last thing I want to say is to talk a little bit about not just television advertising, but all the other things that are going on with, um, with voters. And since um, I'm only familiar, really familiar with the, the Missouri environment, I'll end with a little bit of a story and an experiment we're going to try to conduct in the fall. Um, as I said before, I'm a big D and a small D Democrat, which means that my husband and I, um, in a great moment of insanity, um, wrote checks uh, to people who were running for political office in 2008 and 2010. Consequently, we're on a whole lot of mailing lists. And we're on a whole lot of phone polling lists. Um, we're also, as is everybody I know, on a direct mail list. And because direct mail can be pretty thoroughly targeted to at least income level and lifestyle, the direct mail that I get where I live is not the same direct mail that other people who live in my community will get. So one of the things that we're trying to do in the fall, and I have to give a nod to Sharon Dunwoody because in a way, it's her idea that I'm ripping off. We're doing the give me your mail and phone political study. Um, we're asking people of all ages and all stripes and all politics to essentially collect for us their direct mail advertising, to log for us when they're polled, when they're push polled, um, when they're um, solicited for funds. In Missouri, you have to say solicited for money. There are other connotations. <laughs> and, okay, I don't usually have to explain my jokes that much. <laughs> and, to, to give us that sort of aggregated and very messy data so that we can turn it in to news stories. My expectation is that there will be a group of people in the community where I live who will get direct mail from the NRA, okay? And there'll be another group of people who won't get that direct mail and will be completely unaware that the NRA is direct mailing a group over here. And our goal is essentially to share this information widely so that political messages are not so tightly niched as candidates might like them to be, and so that there's an opportunity for that great group of Missourians who say they are independent. In my state, it's 31%, not the 10% it is in Wisconsin, to actually get a look at the whole campaign and who's supporting it. I think this is the kind of journalism that essentially we're going to have to go to. I think it is a different way of, not, if not fact checking, at least checking the context of facts. And I think that especially for journalists in this day and age, holding campaigns and holding candidates and holding super PACs accountable in a very public way repeatedly is perhaps at least the best route that I can see to piercing some of this. Um, what are we doing? Liar, liar, pants on fire, spin. Um, you only talk to Democrats if you want to hear Democrats, kind of an electoral, electoral map that we have now. So that's kind of my challenge, and we can take it from there. So we'll open it up to questions next, and I think Wendy will be going around to the microphone. We want to make sure the microphone gets to you uh, before we uh, uh, have the question posed. Uh, and also, I think we'll be getting some questions from uh, the back of the room, from Katie and her group. I was just looking on Twitter, and there's just a, a flurry of activity, so <laughs> that's <dear>. exciting. <laughs> um, so uh, other questions? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, the uh, impermeability of these robust belief systems, whether it's uh, political ideology or something else, um, 
is being tracked by a lot of people now across a lot of issues. I know for global warming, the best predictor of what you believe is whether you're a conservative or a liberal. Um, I, with respect to political advertising, though, or advertising, it's such a, a dense part of what uh, the typical TV viewer now will begin to encounter on television. Is there a way, th can you crack that filter with uh, redundancy? Can you, I, I'm just curious about whether there are contingent conditions that would actually begin to break down. If you see an, a, 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 um, a frightfully scary Obama ad, you know, 12 times a night, uh, uh, will an Obama supporter begin to wonder if, in fact, that ad is true? So I, I'm just curious whether we have any data like that. Do you know of any? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I don't. I, I we'll let you come in too, because um, the best evidence we have is that if you're not aware of the source of the message, it may penetrate your cognitive screens a little more than if it's obvious where it's coming from. And so, to the extent that the strongest advertising is hard to miss, you know, in terms of its point and its source. <laughs> Maybe in an odd way, it's less insidious in terms of penetrating to folks that really haven't raised their cognitive shields to it. Um, but I'm not aware of any studies that have very much happy to say about this, except to the extent that because people generally effectively counter-argue against positions they disagree with, um, that they are less influenced by the propaganda from the other side. I do think that the one area is, and it brings us back in a way to news, is that advertising is not the only source of information. Uh, when I was thinking about the conference today, I was thinking about pulling together the ad data for Wisconsin and looking at it, and one of the points that occurred to me is, my goodness, before the first ad aired here for the presidential race anyway, There'd been 20 Republican debates. They'd been highly covered. There was a lot of information, not to mention news about it. And so as concerning as advertising is, let's also remember that folks have a lot of other sources, and especially trusted sources. So if your best friend says, you know that ad they're running is bogus, that's probably far more effective than uh, most of the other things that might counter it. Another, another worthwhile point to make in relation to that question is um, there's a good amount of evidence now that being exposed to political ads makes us more likely to seek out the news uh, and to seek out political information. So when we're exposed to political advertising in densely uh, hit markets, news viewing tends to go up in those markets. Now the one thing that suppresses it is really negative campaigns. Then people don't feel the need to seek out as much. But there's an argument that that might be because they're learning so much from the negative ads, and that's the whole uh, uh, argument about uh, uh, the notion that ads contain a lot of information and sometimes very accurate information, and that a lot of learning takes place. So there's, it's, a, it's a wonderfully complex set of questions. There, uh, uh, go ahead. There was a piece in the New York Times this morning that I've forgotten who did this study that had looked at the most recent spate of highly negative ads that Romney had done against Santorum. And the conclusion, but I can't remember the, the folks who did it, the conclusion was in negative ads, after a certain point, there were diminishing returns. Um, now, whether or not that would hold up in other races, that, that's not clear to me. And actually, that's the first good news about negative advertising I think I've read in a really long time. Erica, did you want to add something? Oh, I was just going to say, one, one thing that I think is really important to keep in mind is that you know, the barrage of advertising is not necessarily intended to shake up those strong partisans on either side, right? They spend a lot of money airing these ads on, on television, and in a, in a lot of ways you could say they're, they're wasting a lot of the funds because they're not going to change these very heavily favored camps, but it is intended to reach those folks in the middle and those folks who don't pay a lot of attention to politics. And the one thing that we do know is that the in increases in number and volume of advertising does increase those folks in the middle who don't pay a lot of attention to politics. It increases their ability to rate candidates and increases their extent to which they can say something meaningful about those candidates. So um, again, I think just that bears keeping in mind. Yep. 
So what are the panelists' opinions on broadcast news media's use of, quote, press ads, airing political ads that ha have often aired minimally or not at all in paid media, yet are given free airtime in broadcast and cable when the focus is on the strategy of the ad rather than the accuracy of it? Um, doesn't this make it more difficult by getting these ads amplified no matter how false they are? I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. I, I just had a, a piece recently published with, again, another former Badger colleague of mine, Travis Ridout, um, where we looked I in 2006, we took an extensive analysis of the, um, it was all in Midwestern markets, so it's nice to discuss that here, um, at the advertising that was aired in uh, nine different Midwestern markets, along with the news coverage in um, local newspapers and local television station coverage of political advertising. And then we matched that all up with a citizen survey to try to get a sense for what the effects were. And um, we were especially interested in looking at citizen perceptions of the tone of the campaign. And um, it is the case that uh, citizen perceptions of tone are responsive to both the tone of advertising, but also to news coverage of advertising. But what's really interesting is that we didn't find evidence that news coverage of, say, negative ads increased perceptions of negativity. It was only when news coverage was strategic. So the strategic, the coverage of strategy and uh, about political advertising that increased and amplified the negativity. So I think that has an interesting implication for the ways in which uh, journalists go about covering advertising and, and the way in which we expect it to have an influence, which, 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 speaks back, which speaks back to a little bit about what Lee was saying earlier, that um, that kind of focus can have important implications. I think there's, the part of it is, is, is if you repeat the ad, you get free media, and part of the art, I'm going to use that word, of doing a good ad watch or doing good reporting on ads is to visually convey it, or in the case of radio, to convey it in an auditory way in such that you know that this is under scrutiny. This is not something that you're just repeating. And, and there, are, I don't, there are templates out there about how to accomplish this and to sort of cue viewers, listeners, and readers that you're not just repeating the content of the ad. Do you have another question? Hi, Lee. Uh, I'm John Smalley from the State Journal here in town. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming. Uh, and a self-confessed member of the disdained uh, mainstream media. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you, uh, on the, the uh, NPR piece that you played, I have a question coming after that, but I just was curious on that NPR piece. Did you or did the station down there see the irony in the fact that this young fellow was doing this story about transparency and fi finding where the money comes from and then interviewed people without telling them he was a reporter? Yes, we, d we did. And in fact, I think in the original edit of this story, because eight minutes is a long time, even for our local NPR affiliate, that that wasn't included. And so part of the discussion in the newsroom was to go back and say, you know what, you're going to ding folks for being less than transparent. Um, maybe you better come kind of clean about how it is that you collected your information. On the other hand, I have to say, since I work with a lot of student journalists who are trying to do this sort of story, that one of the things that happens in my community, remember we have about 1,000 journalists for about 100,000 people. So you know, you've got each 10 people has their very own. Which is a nice ratio. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, is that when oftentimes when, you, when you're a student and we tell them, you know, you have to go and say, hi, my name is Lee Wilkins and I'm representing KBIA that if people don't want to talk to you, even if you think it's necessary, they'll just turn around and, and, and shut you out. And, and that becomes a, a difficult problem in my particular community, but I don't think my particular community is the only community where people are being coached or otherwise encouraged to say, if it's a journalist, you don't answer their question. And, and that's a professional conundrum we have to get through. But, but to answer your specific question, in the editing of this piece, there was a fair amount of discussion about, oh, you use deceptive tactics to get that sound bite. Maybe we need to make that transparent as well. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. Katie, other questions from online? So this one is, I'd be interested in knowing what different panelists would consider to be a beneficial ad environment. What would an ad look like? What is a quality ad today? The empty set. Um, 
<laughs> I, actually, I'm going to speak up a little bit for negative ads uh, because why not? Um, <laughs> There are different qualities of the ads, and I just want to make one of them sort of abundantly clear. And that's the positive ad that has zero content to it. That's the candidate, the spouse, the beautiful kids, and almost always a golden retriever. Um, <laughs> and the American know, flag. And the American flag, yes. <laughs> running across some nice green lawn, all right? And a lot of those kinds of introductory ads uh, are feel-good ads, but they tell you, in some cases, literally zero about the candidate, except they appear to have human housemates and a dog. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there are also the positive ads, somewhat rare, but not non-existent where the candidate looks straight into the camera and tells you what I'm running on and what I'm for. Those are not devoid of content. When we go to the negative ads, you also have many that are sometimes called comparative. I'll let Erica speak to the coding of this. Sometimes called comparative ads and sometimes contrast, where you know a candidate says, I'm for these things, but my opponent wants these opposite things. And sometimes that's said in a very harsh, negative way. But there's a direct comparison of what I'm for and what he's for. And especially if it's embarrassing to your opponent when you say, this guy voted for so-and-so, well, who else is going to tell you that? It's for sure that candidate isn't going to tell you about the bad things he did or she did at some point. And then finally you get to the you know, slash and burn negative ad that's in black and white with uh, uh, a horror theme to it. Um, of assertion after assertion after assertion that are negative against your opponent that say absolutely nothing about you and what you're for. So I just want to put on the table this, this range of advertising. If we think of only the horror stories or on the opposite end, think only of the family and the dog, I think we're looking at a very different species of how much information is contained. Yeah, and I think it's also, it, we, we, it, it would be a shame if we sort of uh, wanted a world in which there, was, there were no negative advertising, no negative ads on television. I mean, I think the, even the pure negative spots, so the, the way in which we sort of triage the coding is promote and positive spots are ads that talk solely about you, so they are of the variety of the candidate in the uh, blue shirt and khaki pants walking through the, the, the park with the dog. <laughs> and then... Um, the contrast ads are ads in which you contrast yourself with your opponent, so both candidates are mentioned. And then the pure attack ads are the ones that only mention the opponent. But even if you look at the pure attack category, um, it's not the case that most of these ads are, say, the really evil, vicious, uncivil, personal attacks. That these ads and these negative, um, the, the negative spot it is primarily made up of lots of claims about policy and, and issue. And, and negative ads, the other thing we know about them is they're more likely con to contain sites to media um, statements. They're more, they are just in general, tend to be much more substantive. And they're also necessary for challengers. If you're a challenger and you're trying to convince people that, that e they should vote for you, how else are you going to do so except by uh, uh, discussing the track record of your opponent? And so negativity, I think, is important. It plays a role in, in democracy. And I think we, we would be foolish to claim that we would want a world in which there was no negativity. It, it's very important. And I think it does play a large role there. So certainly, the, f the negativity that citizens, I think, remember are the ones that tend to be of the particularly vicious uncivil variety. And there certainly are those on the airwaves. But the vast majority of the ads, even the negative ads that air, um, are not of that variety. I think it's also important to remember that um, John Gere has written an excellent book on this in mm -hmm. defense of negativity about the amount of learning that takes place from negative ads. But even more than that, we know uh, from old research by Steve Chafee, our colleague at Wisconsin, and some of his students that um, the people who tend to learn from political ads are the people who aren't consuming the news. If you consume the news, you tend to be somewhat inoculated against the effects of political ads largely. And it's the people who are low in news consumption that tend to rely more on political ads for learning. So the idea that they would somehow you know, get this anyway, they may not be watching the news at all. And so it's important to remember where the audiences are, especially in a more fragmented environment. 
Other questions? Wendy? One more question. We have one more from the back. We'll go to Katie first, and then Wendy, one last question from the floor. Okay, I think this will be fast. Um, I'm a student covering the Wisconsin, the upcoming Wisconsin recall election. What are a few things I shouldn't do when it comes to ads? That's your wheelhouse, Charles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Yes. I gotta do that? Uh, I guess, you know, sort of in keeping here, one issue is the, the strategy, the volume of ads rather than the content of, being, of ads. If you bought what we were all just saying, then the content of those ads deserves to be discussed and um, fact-checked on the one hand, but discussed in the way they set up what are the positions that one side is taking versus the other. So in that sense, I think maybe there's a positive way of covering the ads that takes their substance seriously and talks about them, at least for these kinds of comparative ads that we were just talking about, and arguably for negative and the subtype of positive in which the candidate is presenting their own position. So I think, I think in that they could be covered quite nicely. I'll Last question from the floor. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I heard an NPR piece about um, a very close race, like Senate race in California. And um, I don't remember who it was, but the person that was like really close to, I guess, like tied with a Republican, he said that two weeks before elections, there was um, someone who sponsored ads that were very expensive and were against him. And he wondered, like, he, w I mean, he would never know if he would have had the chance like, to win. But with those ads where he was on TV all the time, he thought, well, I really have no chance of winning now. And then after the polls, they realized that the gap was much larger after those ads aired. And I don't know if you have done any studies of, I guess, like, what would happen, sorry, what would, um, I don't know, like, with those, like, last minute ads, what influence do they have? Thank you, thank you. Charles, or? Yeah, I, I'm not so sure that it's so much about the last minute nature, although there certainly is something to be said for that, but um, John Zoller has written a really nice book on uh, what we know about two-sided flows of information, that in more competitive races, you tend to have both sides countering each other and countering, e countering each other fairly equally. And so in those types of races, you're going to not find very much persuasion because the two sides really equally cancel each other out. Um, where we do, seen, seen, we do see more evidence of persuasion it are the circumstances in which you have one-sided um, a one-sided flow of information in which a candidate attacks and there is no response. And so it, it's definitely under those types of circumstances where you would expect to see movement. Um, people wanted to claim, for example, in Florida, that, and, and it was the case that Romney, it was one-sided domination in the Florida primary of Romney and his super PAC against Gingrich. And so lots of people wanted to claim that that was evidence of uh, uh, the ads making a big difference there. And one of the things that I said was, OK, well, hey, hold on. There was a lot of other things going on that were working against Gingrich in that particular um, primary. You had the Republican establishment coming out against him. You had all these other evidence in, in news media. So certainly, under those conditions, we expect an ads to, to have an influence. But again, they're not the only thing that I think um, will matter. But that doesn't speak directly to your question, but I hope that. But it I, I think you I think you raise an important point, and and one that we should all sort of I think emphasize is that you know the biggest ad buy is not necessarily destiny, and I think that that the more local you get, the more likely that is actually to be the case. So in your local city council race or your local school board race, you know he who has the most or she who has the most advertising is not necessarily the candidate or the person who's going to win. Um, this is one of those places where I think your level of analysis really does matter because partisanship itself is not so tightly held when you're talking about the city council as when you're talking about the presidency. A lot of those filters filter very differently depending on what the question is you're being asked. I think we'll end there. We should thank our panelists. <laughs>